Hey, you all, Carpetbagger here, coming to you live from the north, way north, here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And even more specifically than that, I am at R-O-M, the R-O-M, the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum. Now, as I've traveled across the United States into Canada, trying to, on my journeys, visit different museums. I love a good traditional natural history museum, a good classic museum, and kind of been trying to visit the different museums in the different cities that I go to. And I was near, we we're staying near the Canadian border, so I decided today I was gonna hop on over here to Toronto and visit uh, the Royal Ontario Museum. This is the largest museum in the country of Canada and one of the largest museums in North America. So looking very forward to checking out what lies within these walls. Please follow me. See this kind of grand building here. See the carvings here in the stone. The arts of man through all the years. You can see the engraving there. The Royal Ontario Museum. I like the old timey font where they use V's instead of U's. This very grand entrance corridor here. The mural there on the ceiling. So we head into the hall here. See some dinosaur bones there in the wall. It looks like they're unloading a new exhibit here. It's not yet open. It's death life's greatest mystery. They actually ran this at the Field Museum in Chicago, and unfortunately I missed it. Apparently I missed it again here because it's not ready, but one day I will uh, catch up with it. Some taxidermy here, the bear, the eagle. And look what we have over here. Massive glowing purple set of dinosaur bones. So do we want to take the elevators over here or do we want to head up the Stair of Wonders? I guess we gotta go with the Stair of Wonders or the Escalier des Merviales. The Stairs of Wonder. Oh yeah, look what we have here on the Stair of Wonders. There's some birds in there. Some uh, decorative glass. And some uh, jars of fun here. Glowing creatures have their internal organs dyed so they glow more clearly. Yeah, these stairs actually are really cool. Look at that up there, almost like a walking up an Escher painting of some sort. Now it does appear that they're doing a significant amount of renovations currently, but uh, headed here into the into the dinosaur section. Check out this dinite. Di dynite dine oh my gosh Dinachus Oh man I I know I've said this word before Dionychus Dionychus there we go Dionychus Look at all these spooky dinosaur bones over here This chart here shows what is real, and uh, everything here is real. We got the real skull of the Ankylosaurus there, the Ankylosaurus skull, and that is the tail there. The tail they use like a giant mace. 
Well, that is pretty awesome. Now, this is pretty helpful. They actually show you what is actual dinosaur bone there in the yellow and what is, uh, you know, what's been replaced. This here, this is the Edmontosaurus skull. That's just completely, completely real there. Um, and up here, this guy on the wall, you can look there, and almost all of him is original. Looks like they did a little touch up on his nose and a little replacement of the tail there. So that's 100% dinosaur bone. Just had to give him a little bit, a little bit of a nose job. These little guys here, they're, they're complete fakes. <laughs> Blue says, not real, that's cast. I mean, they were real, taken from, taken from uh, something else, but uh, that's not actual dinosaur bone. And this is one thing I've noticed about going to Canadian attractions. They really make clear what's real and what's not. Not that they like lie like crazy in, uh, in U.S. museums or anything like that, but just uh, Canadians seem very interested in, uh, in being very clear, differentiating fact between fiction. So every dinosaur shows what parts of the dinosaur are real and what parts are replica. I know, you know, you go to a museum in the States, usually it's a little, little more vague about what you're looking at. But uh, yeah, that is mostly real. The head is fake, but most of the bones there are real. Over here you have the Inostrancia, vicious looking predator. And uh, I guess you can crawl into this bubble to get a, a closer look at the Inostrancia. So let's head down underneath here. Oh my gosh. All right. Like that. Oh, it says this beast doesn't survive. So it shows that that is extinct there and then this beast this beast survives but we may help it survive extreme conditions through tough times oh yeah look at that little beast he's a he's a cute little guy <laughs> See this giant predatory fish here it looks like you can actually climb inside the belly of this massive predator here. This is pretty fascinating, talking about the origins of hands here. See this fish that instead of fins has like developed these stubs. But you can look how it uh, shows the inside of the stubs there. And there's a little tiny hand developing in there. A giant sea scorpion there using his pinchers to catch this poor unfortunate little fish. Say there, see the pinchers? They're like shears, a quick slash, and you're in two. Yikes. Now, lots of fossils in here. I actually find this very interesting. In addition to showing the fossils, they show in large versions of what these prehistoric little animals would have looked like, like a little weird shrimp monster there. Yeah, you can see that fossil there. And then an enlarged version. What that little critter may have looked like. I like this guy here. He's very adorable. And by the way, I do think we are, I do think I'm walking through the exhibit backwards. Because we started with the dinosaurs. And now we're going to more and more simplistic creatures. This here looks like a artichoke with a mohawk. A very extensive collection on these early organisms. Here's another set of stairs. I don't think these are the stairs of wonder. You have this 
towering totem pole headed up to multiple staircases here. Next up we have the Life in Crisis exhibit. The uh, rhinoceros there, one of the animals known, uh, known for having issues with uh, extinction. Here we have the Great Lakes area, I guess Toronto, part of the Great Lakes region. I also grew up in the Great Lakes region myself, over in northern Indiana. You see the very, very uh, majestic bald eagle there. Some other creatures from the area, beavers, ducks. Number oh, look at this big fish here. That is a... Uh, a a, is a, double a muscalunge, a muscalunge. See those muscles there clogging up the pipe. That actually is a big problem in the uh, Great Lakes region. They introduced new mussel species. They ended up just uh, being a nuisance, clogging up drains and destroying the ecosystem. Here's a caribou or reindeer. And uh, one thing I never noticed, I guess I never never looked, they have very interesting toes. Look how far apart their hooves are. Oh, look at this. Above our heads, you can see the birds flying above us in their glass bird box. See that delicious salmon there. See the fox there. Chaos Reigns, little buddy. Big tortoise. And the terrifying baboon. Just talking about species that follow humans around the world. And uh, three great examples of that right there. Rats, mice, and cats. And yes, absolutely, wherever, wherever there's humans, there's mice to, uh, and rats to try to steal their food, steal our food supply. Not, not steal all of it, just borrow a little bit for themselves. And then uh, wherever there's rats and mice following humans around, cats are there to uh, eat the mice and rats to kill them. And of course, humans don't like the mice and rats destroying their food supply. So we've always been cool with the cats hanging around. In fact, We've become pretty good, pretty good friends with the cats over the uh, over the centuries. Must say, this museum does have some really good taxidermy displays. Just a lot of color used. It's kind of a bright, vibrant taxidermy exhibit here. Oh boy, that is quite the cobra there. Maybe the most massive cobra I've ever seen. He looks angry too. Little prairie dogs here, but if you look down the hole, you don't see any prairie dogs. You see a little owl. There is the American bison or buffalo there eating a little bit of grass. It does say here. American bison, sometimes incorrectly called the buffalo. And, you know, that statement may technically be true, but um, I don't know, I kind of feel like the American bison has been called the buffalo so much. Like, traditionally, the Native Americans, as well as the white settlers, always referred to this animal as the buffalo, to the point where I think, you know, bison or buffalo, I feel like both names are appropriate. Oh man, look at this giant sunfish. Absolute massive animal there. One of the craziest looking creatures. Oh, and look at that. Behind him, behind the sunfish, we can see that dinosaur from the first floor. Some wonderful sea creatures here above our head. Swordfish there. The beluga whale. Some vicious sharks over here. Oh, 
See that shark there's got a little lamprey stuck to his chin. Kind of like a little fish beard. The different squids and octopuses there. All these different crustaceans. And then look at how many different types of flat fish there are. Fish laying on the ground like like their uh, area rugs. Run away, little guys, because this Arctic fox has a taste for cuteness. And the ultimate showdown here, polar bear versus seal. Up here we see a massive narwhal hanging from the ceiling. Look how long, look how long that horn is. It's actually one of their teeth grows out of their mouth. But yeah, what a strange creature. They actually have a taxidermied panda here. And uh, for long, this may be the only way you could see uh, pandas in North America is the taxidermied versions. I think the Atlanta pandas are still there, but they're set to go back this year and then there will be no pandas in North America. And of course, one of my favorite fish down here Every proper museum needs to have a coelocanth. They're the fish that was believed to have been uh, extinct millions of years. And then one was just swimming around off the coast of South Africa like, it, like, like everything was just going normal. That there is a wolverine, one of the most uh, Misunderstood animals. I believe a lot of people think that wolverines are actually a type of wolf. Apparently Hugh Jackman even thought at one point that wolverines were a type of wolf. But he was wrong. They're more like a badger or a skunk. Very sad section here on animals that are uh, extinct due to the intervention of man. We have a uh, taxidermy great auk here. Which I don't think I've ever seen a taxidermy great auk before. It's an extinct type of penguin. There's a uh, passenger pigeon and uh, just a month or so ago went to the Cincinnati Zoo where the passenger pigeon actually went extinct and uh, the dodo here which is a skeleton because I don't think any taxidermy dodos actually exist. That is a thylacine skull, the Tasmanian tiger. Now they are extinct the best of human knowledge, but I know there is um, some people claim that they are they're, they're, they are still alive. They're, they're, occasionally there is a thylacine spotting. The tentacles of a giant squid up there. And here is the Great Lakes Vampire. Sounds really spooky. This is the, uh, the sea lamprey there. See it sucked on to the uh, lake trout. It's an invasive species there show up and uh, and suck our fish. Some deep sea fish, which are some of the creepiest fish that exist. That is a crested oarfish there. And some uh, other spooky fish down here, little creepy angler fish. Yeah, look at that guy down there. That is a spooky fish. Some strange and unusual creatures over here. This is the tripod fish. Chew bill there. Very interesting looking bird. And then the world's largest flower here it says that it uh, only opens for a few days. It emits a foul smell. It smells like a dead body to attract flies. It's the Chinese salamander there, the world's largest amphibian, the size of a dog. I would look at this crazy guy. Yeah, he definitely reminds me of the uh, Dilophosaurus from Jurassic Park. So we are headed into the Bat Cave over here. Okay, into the Bat Cave here. It's like a simulated Bat Cave. Oh, look at this poor little, poor little goat here. It's being attacked by vampire bats. They're sucking his blood. At least he seems to be in good spirits. He doesn't look too bothered by the fact that there's animals drinking his blood. Oh, 
one. Look at this bat here, carrying a mouse, bites into a mouse's brain and then flies away with it. Oh, I just noticed this over here. We have Batman here in the Bat Cave, but also uh, Count Orlock from Nosferatu. Head deeper into the cave here. You can see the bats overhead there. I can see the little bats there clinging to the cave wall. There must be thousands see of the, mostly cockroaches. Well, the cockroaches down there. It said they're eating bat dung. Have the uh, backyard section there, animals that actually live at your house. See a normal house here. Got raccoons playing in the trash there. Got birds making uh Nests on top of your, on top of your uh, porch light. Some giant moss there hiding in the light. The Ontario Wild section. Animals you find here in Ontario: the wolf there, and of course, the mighty Canadian moose. Here's a Carolinian forest. Now, apparently, Carolinian forest is a forest range that starts at the Carolinas and extends all the way up into Canada. We can see some familiar folks here from the Carolinas. Of course the uh, the mighty possum there. And the ultimate showdown. Coyote versus porcupine. Uh, here we have the wall of skulls here. It is an impressive collection of skulls of different horned animals here. You see the big moose skull there in the center. It's here on the wall here talking about honeybees. And then behind this curtain, living bees. It's an actual bee colony here in the museum. And you can see the tube there where bees can actually come and go from the Royal Ontario Museum as they please. Interesting over here is a room full of birds. You can see birds in all the different boxes. There, the ostrich over here. And this here, the largest, one of the largest flying birds I've ever seen. Apparently that is an albatross. It's, uh, it's incredibly huge. You have birds flying above us. You can see the flying flamingo there. These birds flying over in this direction. And this is interesting, coming out of the birds, coming out of all the animals. Over here, we have a toy soldier collection. So let's check out all the little toy soldiers. See the toy soldiers here running away from this Wily Brontosaurus. Go ahead and hate your neighbor. Go ahead and cheat a friend. Do it in the name of heaven. You can justify it in the end. There won't be any trumpets blowing come the judgment day. Cause on the bloody morning after, one tin soldier rides away. We have stumbled into Ancient world history. See all these Roman busts here in the Rome section. This is Emperor Lucius Verus here. Now this is interesting. These are Etruscan offerings. So these are offerings given to their deity. People would create images of their own head and give them as offerings. Apparently they would give an offering of a swaddled infant if they were seeking out fertility. And if they had a particular ailment, they would uh, give an offering of a replica of that ailment. So you see like, if they're having an eye issue, they would offer up a, uh, a eyeball, if they're having trouble hearing, offer up a, uh, a ear. Maybe if they're having a heart attack, offer up a heart, asking for help with their heart. And I guess it's for people with foot pain. 
So this section talks about Roman Egypt, a period of time where the Romans controlled Egypt. And it shows some of the mixings of the culture. Where we have part of a sarcophagus there, like the Egyptians would use in mummification, but done in a Roman styling. Very interesting. But of course, when visiting the Egyptian section of a museum, the real question we ask is, do they have mummies? And the answer is, yes, they have mummies. They have this mummy here, Nakat. Nakat the mummy. You can see Nakat here, a, a more natural mummifying process as he was a working class Egyptian. And you can see he's not covered in bandages, but was placed in a coffin and given a more natural burial. But uh, yeah, he is, uh, he dates all the way back to 12th century BC. See his feet there. And there is his heart dried on a dish. His liver, liver of Nakat there. And over here next to his head, that is his dried brain. Hmm. You see an Egyptian woman doing her hair and makeup. Here we can see another mummy in the sarcophagus. This is Aunt Jow, the mummy. You can see they actually have uh, hair on their head. Yeah. Looks like he's wrapped all the way down there, but his uh, head poking out the top showing his long locks. They have their animal mummies over here, the falcons, the cats, the crocodiles, the ibises, and uh, that's, a, that's a little gazelle there. See a little miniature mummy there. That's actually a ceremonial mummy made out of the soil of the Nile, put in its own little sarcophagus. I don't know, something makes me slightly nervous about walking through a maze of statues that are, you know, a couple thousand years old a piece. See a statue of the goddess Athena there from the Parthenon in Greek. Now in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, you can actually see a life-size recreation of this, and it's enormous. You can see the people down there and how big the statue is. Yeah, there's actually a replica of the Parthenon in Nashville that has a life-size uh, recreation of Athena as well. Yeah, here's a model of what the Parthenon originally would have looked like. And I do find this fascinating. They have the, the brightly colored statue there. And this is how these old Greek statues would originally appear. We see them all white, like we saw the white ones as we were walking back here. That's how they're displayed in museums. But actually, when they were displayed back in ancient times, they were covered in bright colored paintings. I don't know, maybe we should repaint all these statues so they're more accurate. Some medieval European artifacts in here. It's the statue of Mary and Jesus. Yeah, some very, very old furniture in here. Remember to use a coaster. Look at this. Each little cup and saucer has its own shelf. Yeah, they have these little tableaus, little rooms set up for different periods. Here is the 1700s in France. A wealthy living room there. Looks like they're, they have a dinner of some massive oysters there. That's pretty cool. We have some authentic suits of armor here. This is uh, German suits of armor. That's pretty cool. It's uh, an Italian suit of armor there. This is pretty amazing. This is... Uh, Armor for sports. This is armor that'd be used in a jousting competition. There. There is a uh, 
a pole axe. This will be used once they're knocked off the horse. This is what they would fight with. This here is a carousel lance. This isn't necessarily used to impale somebody, but rather to uh, grab a ring, much like a golden ring is grabbed on a modern carousel. Wow, yeah, the swords that knights would use. See a piece of chain mail there as well. This is Maximilian armor from the uh, 1500s. Here it compares the medieval armor to the modern day hockey uniform. Right here a case of dueling pistols when two individuals will be having a duel to the end of their lives. They would each grab one of these uh, pistols, take a certain number of paces and turn around and fire upon one another. They cover a wide variety of different cultures in here. Here are some Solomon Island war clubs. And over here, an exhibit on the Aboriginal people of Taiwan. A variety of different Polynesian carvings here. It's a collection of African masks here. Just how elaborate some of these are. Past the Lego dinosaur here, we exit through the gift shop. Oh, here we have a uh, little snow globe of the ROM, the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum there, with glitter fluttering through the sky. Of course, any Canadian gift shop has uh, maple syrup, different varieties there. And look at this. This is a little drop of maple syrup named Sappy. Sappy's Great Maple Adventure from Tree to Table. You can even take home a piece of uh, armor or one of these uh, Greek statues. We exit through this very modern looking building here. Of course, we entered a very old looking building. So the building itself kind of a mashup between a classic old style building and this more modern art style building. Although it did look like they're doing uh, quite a bit of construction here on the, uh, on the newer looking part. This part here, a lot of the sections were actually closed today as they apparently doing some renovations in this quadrant of the building. Yeah, I've been over here in Canada the last couple days. I've not gotten any new pressed pennies. Of course, 2024, the year of the pressed penny here on the Carpetbagger channel. Uh, but I noticed I wasn't able to find any pressed pennies over here in Canada. And I realized they don't have pennies in Canada anymore. They got rid of them. They abolished pennies. They must have gotten rid of the pressed penny machines along with it. I don't know, maybe Canada never really had pressed penny machines. Maybe that's more of a uh, U.S. Uh, tradition, smashing our pennies. But, you know, as soon as I get back on the road in the United States, I will definitely be continuing my search for pressed pennies. And that was the Royal Ontario Museum, a massive museum. I wasn't able to cover all of it in this video, but I gave you guys a little sampling of what they have in there. A great museum, a great uh, natural history museum. They have dinosaurs, they have taxidermy. They also have a lot of ancient history. You saw in there just crazy seeing statues that in, in that museum that are actually older than Jesus, literally older than Jesus. And um, that covered a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that you normally wouldn't see in a museum in America. So this is, you know, stuff that a lot of times you may have to go over to Europe to see certain things like that, like the suits of armor and things like that. You can actually uh, see here on our continent, here in uh, in the city of Toronto. So yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of very, very old things, a lot of European style things, things from uh, other cultures that you don't always see in museums in the States. So definitely glad I got a chance to come over here and check out the Royal Ontario Museum. So I want to thank you guys for uh, joining me today on another museum exploration. Uh, if you guys like these videos, please subscribe. 
I travel around the country. I film roadside attractions, amusement parks, museums, haunted houses, and other fun stuff. Uh, if you do subscribe, if you do give a thumbs up, if you do leave a comment, if you share, it really does help the channel I'm trying to grow little by little. Um, if you'd like help in other ways, consider contributing to Patreon. Three dollars or more gets you a postcard once a month from me to you. Also selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop and um, doing personalized messages on Cameo. If you're interested in sending a personal message from me to a friend, to a family member, to yourself, check out the description of this video. And of course, all those things help keep this train on the track, this boat in the water, and this dirigible in the air. Until next time, my friends, this one's in the bag.